Freeman, when I was a student, I had to decide between physics and brain science, which would give me the most fundamental appreciation of reality. It, I chose brain science, and I've always wondered, should I have done physics? Uh, you've had such an unbelievable career. Tell me about physics and why it's so fundamental. I hate the word fundamental. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's one thing I've not been chasing after in, in my career as a scientist. I, I love details. I like to look at the real thing and try to understand it. I don't give a damn whether it's fundamental <laughs> or not. And, I mean, it, it, it happens that physics has a sort of reputation of being fundamental, which I think is mostly a fake. <laughs> and, and the same could be said of brain science. <laughs> so to me, those are not important questions. What, the important think... things are just the details. What 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 wonderful things are out there, and how how how, how su subtle and 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 beautiful are the tools we've invented? Yeah. I mean, science to me is about tools, not about concepts. And, why do so many fundamental physicists, as they're called, uh, take such uh, uh, pride in their fundamentalism? Well, there are different kinds of people. Fortunately, we need different kinds of people. I'm, I'm, I'm a frog and they're a bird. <laughs> that, that, that's roughly the classification that I use. I mean, birds are the people who fly high and look out over the landscape. And, and they are, of course, very proud of being fundamental. But, but uh, the frogs, meanwhile, live in the mud and, and, and actually study the flowers <laughs> and find out what's really going on. What are some of the beautiful flowers that you've uh, seen in your career? Basically, I'm a mathematician, so mm -hmm. my tools are essentially calculations. Mm -hmm. The most beautiful things I've done, actually, are, are pure mathematics, mm -hmm. which have nothing to do with physics. I mean, I, I discovered a, a beautiful theorem concerning sequences of, of, of integers, which only about three people in the world ever <laughs> understood or were interested in. But it just is unutterably beautiful. It's, it's, uh, mathematics is full of gems like that, mm. and physics is too. So an, another thing I did was a, a, a subject called random matrices, which I did 45 years ago, and, and the main reason that it was supposed to be interesting was that Eugene Wigner, who was a great physicist who lived here in Princeton, thought it was a way of looking at nuclei. It was supposed oh. to have something to do with nuclear physics. So that a, a nucleus was a black box, essentially a, 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 a ball full of particles strongly interacting. You didn't understand the details of what was going on. So you represent it by a completely random system. Mm. And so he invented this theory of random, what he called random matrices, which is representing a physical system by something as random as possible. But so that nothing about it, except for just its basic symmetry, is known. So you just take the average over all possible systems. And this was, it turned out to be a very fruitful line of inquiry. And so I chased after that. And I became one of the, 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 so the, the main developers of the field mm. about 40 years ago. And then it went mm. out of fashion. And nothing much was heard of it for, for, the, for about 25 years. And now it's back. Now yeah. I've there are, there are big conferences organized now to which I'm invited because I'm a sort of historical monument. <laughs> Anyhow, it is a very beautiful subject. It's beautiful mostly because of its mathematical beauty. But now it turns out, because of the advances in computer science, that one can actually use it in a much more practical way than we had imagined 40 years ago. That's so characteristic of much of mathematics that when it's developed at the time for its purity and its elegance and its beauty is there and the people who do it cannot possibly imagine any practical application of it. In fact, they're often proud of that. And then decades later, it has use. Yes, well, so I just was at a meeting in Rutgers just this weekend in which there was a lot of talk about random matrices. And, and it, the beauty of it is I can actually understand what they're talking about. <laughs> Even though 40 years have gone by, it hasn't changed all that much. And, mm. and So anyway, I enjoyed that a lot. So that's a sort of example. There's really nothing fundamental about it. It's an example just where a, a, an elegant mathematical tool can actually teach us a great deal. And, and this is, of course, the great mystery that uh, why is mathematics so effective? 
That was a question which Wigner raised, and Famously. he called it the, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. That that itself is a fundamental uh, reality, and uh, you know it. it you it's... can call it fundamental if you like. It's real anyway. <laughs> You have characterized yourself as a, and your generation of physicists, as being conservatives. That's true, yes. And uh, I was fascinated by that. Yes, and this sort of, this contempt for the fundamental is part of that. Mm. So the, the ge generation before, the people who had brought about this wonderful revolution of quantum mechanics in the 1920s, they uh, were sort of intoxicated with their success. and. Yeah. And these people, including Einstein and Dirac and, and Heisenberg and Schrodinger, they all of them then afterwards thought they had to do something fundamental. And so they chased after will-o'-the-wisps, and, and each of them had a private theory of everything which turned out, <laughs> to, turned out to be nonsense. So my generation, in reaction against that, said simply, let's tool, use the tools we have and find out how far they can go. And, and so going back to the existing tools, but using them creatively, we did pretty well, and, and though we didn't pretend to be fundamental, we actually did a lot better than the old, the, the, the old generation. Each of whom had their own pet idea that was going to explain everything in their unique way. That's right. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 the only one of that generation who actually did what they intended to do successfully was Max Delbruck. Mm. But he was also one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics and a very a brilliant young man in, in that generation. But he decided if he wanted to do something yeah. fundamental, he better move out of <laughs> physics. And he became a yeah, biologist right. and, of course, st st started what we now call molecular biology. Mm. So he was the, the, he was the only one of that whole crowd who really hit the jackpot. <laughs> Now, you played a critical role uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that movement uh, with Richard Feynman and Schwinger in, in terms of the, the theory of, of quantum electrodynamics. How, 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 how did that come to be? Well, that was, of course, cleaning up what had been done in the 1920s. That the, the Quantum electrodynamics was actually d invented by Heisenberg and Dirac. It was part of the quantum revolution. They did their great work in, the, in, I think, 1929 or so, just a few years after quantum mechanics was mm. invented. So Heisenberg and Dirac and, and, and Fermi created this new science of quantum electrodynamics, which was a, a very successful ver version of atomic physics, including radiation, essentially bringing radiation, that, that's the Maxwell field, into quantum mechanics, which they did very successfully. The only problem was it was mathematically a mess. Mm. And they, they had the physics right, but the mathematics was lousy and ran into all sorts of inconsistencies. So that was what we inherited, we being the Schwinger and Feynman and Tomonaga in the new generation mm. in the 40s. So what the young generation did was to take this physics and without adding any new ideas, just clean it up. And, and that's what quantum electrodynamics became. Then it became a more or less mathematically respectable subject in which you could do calculations precisely, which, of course, Dirac and Heisenberg could not. <laughs> uh, people would argue with your characterization of just cleaning up in terms of what your, your accomplishment was, but I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, of course, in the case of Feynman, he did more than just clean it up. He invented this new pictorial way of looking right. at things, which actually turned out to have a much wider application. Mm. So, so the Feynman view of physics, which is so ge making physics geometric, what he called the space-time approach, that actually turned out to be something much more important. Now there's a new generation. Everybody's talking about uh, quantum gravity and unifying these apparently disparate areas of general relativity, which deals with the whole universe, and quantum mechanics, which deals with subatomic particles. And everybody says that these have to be unified. Uh, you said that maybe the inconsistency is something that is not so terrible. Right. Yes, that's something I, I, I've been actually looking at on a technical on a technical level, whether actually it makes any sense to talk about a graviton as a quantum of gravity. I mean, a, a graviton is supposed to be the sort of incarnation of quantum gravity. It's it's a particle which is made out of gravitational fields. And is quantized. The question is, if like it, the photon in yes, like the photon in the Maxwell theory. Right. 
But the question is, which I'm raising, which is, suppose the graviton exists, is there any way we could tell? Is there, is there in principle, any way we could detect a single graviton? I mean, we know we can detect classical gravitational waves. There's a big machine called LIGO, which has been built just to do that. But, of course, LIGO is far too insensitive to detect a single graviton. And so, so the beautiful thing is that if you try to design a LIGO apparatus for detecting a single graviton, you have to have two mirrors, which and the light travels back and forth. And as the graviton c comes by, the space-time is distorted a bit, so the distance between the two mirrors changes very, very slightly. And if you look at the way that the laws of quantum mechanics constrain the movements of the mirrors, you can't actually constrain the mirrors very closely unless they're extremely heavy. And if you calculate, if you have a single graviton, precisely how heavy the mirrors have to be, it turns out they're precisely as heavy as would mean that they collapse into a black hole. <laughs> so nature, in fact, <laughs> destroys the experiment before it can be completed. <laughs> So I find that sort of nice. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, 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 nature sets the limits to what you can do. And that's, of course, a, a style of argument that Bohr w w w was the master of, and Niels Bohr in, at the beginnings of quantum mechanics loved to do that kind of an argument. So I'm very happy to find it's still alive and well. <laughs> well, what, what does that tell you, though, about physics when you look upon it as a bird? from a high level, I mean, let's, uh, you know, metamorphose yourself into a bird from a frog. And when you look at it from your perspective, what do you see? Well, I see Niels Bohr, after all, was right. He said, whenever it was, 80 years ago, that there really are two worlds. There's the classical world and the quantum world, and that they are separate. But they both exist, they're both real. So it's a sort of a dual view, a dualist view of, 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 of nature. And that was Bohr's gospel, and that, that that's how he understood quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics does not explain everything. You have to have a classical world as well. Mm. The quantum theory deals with the future, and the classical world deals with the past. Mm. So what I'm saying is that this is still true. It's no longer fashionable. Nowadays, all the young people think everything has to be quantized. <laughs> but I like to go back to Bohr. <laughs>